there. Welcome to the Spot Actor Podcast. I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. On today's podcast, we're talking about how beliefs affect your skin and your health. My guest is Dr. Mario Martinez. He is a clinical neuropsychologist who specializes in how cultural beliefs impact health and longevity. He proposes that longevity is learned and the causes of health are inherited. He has studied healthy individuals 100 years or older worldwide and found that only 20 to 25% can be attributed to genetics. The rest is related to how they live and the cultural beliefs they share. Dr. Martinez is the author of the best-selling book, The Mind-Body Code, How to Change the Beliefs that Limit Your Health, Longevity, and Success. In today's interview, we talk about how to identify situations and beliefs that are impacting your health and your skin. And Dr. Martinez gives specific examples on ways to shift these into healing opportunities for your skin and your health. So please enjoy this interview. Mario, it's so great to have you back on the Spot Doctor podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a while. I really, really enjoy our conversations. Yeah, absolutely. So for people who didn't catch your podcast interview when you came on before, let's let's do a little review of, of that to start because I think it's so interesting. And I do encourage people to go back and watch that because everything from that interview is still relevant. And we want to just add on to the the new things that you've been discovering. So it's great. We'll we'll get um we'll get into that soon. But just to, to start, I love, I, you know, I'm so fascinated by this idea that we covered last time on that we're so impacted by our culture, how we're raised, who's in our environment, the people around us, and not just on a, a, a you know, a psychological level, but on a physical level too. And so, um, you know, give us, give everybody kind of an overview of what we, you know, what we talked about last time as it regards to that. Okay. I think your audience will be very compatible because of the work you do. But what I'm bringing into science is that we, it's, it's indisputable now. Uh, everyone would agree that mind and body communicate with each other. I think what's missing is that it communicate in a cultural context. And culture, the easiest way to describe it, although anthropologists will argue for, for, for years, basically very simple. It's a collective belief of our, about very important things in life, aesthetics, wellness, ethics, uh, things that really matter. And since our biology will follow our consciousness and our belief system, then culture is very powerful. Neuropsychologically, we can, I can give you a lot of examples, uh, psychoneurologically. So basically, the way to look at it is that the world is out there, and the world has infinite possibility of interpretation. You can interpret it in many ways. And the culture will weave a fabric around the world, and what you see is the fabric rather than the world. So an example of that, if you shame somebody in the United States, who, which is a an individualist uh, culture, uh, and the person sees the shame, feel, feels the shame, they have inflammatory uh, um, molecules, uh, um, tumor necrosis factor and other things. You go to a collective um, culture like Korea or Japan, and you insult them, they would only have that respond if they see that in insult as uh, shaming their family, their, their, their job, their people. So it's a collectivist kind of thing. If you ask people to see things uh, neuropsychologically, you show them something and the individualist cultures will remember details of the individual. The collectives will uh, remember interactions between the individual and the environment. So it's, it's the, the brain is cultural and the immune system is culture. It, it has to be because we lost our, our epigenetics that we have as animals. Um, uh, a rat, you give them a poison and you let them groom, and the two rats will never eat the poison again, nor their offsprings will eat the poison. But we lost that because we have language. You have, we, we just say, don't eat that. That's, uh, but in order to compensate, the immune system has to respond to biosymbols, not just to, to, to the biology, but the biosymbols. And here, you see a stop sign, and you stop. And you might ha even have a little bit of adrenaline. You go to the Amazons, and they see an octagonal red thing with some, some red signs and, and, and white... Uh, what appears to be symbols. No idea, no response. Why? Because we're, we're conditioned culturally for our biology to respond to whatever the collectivist uh, tribe says to us. Yeah, absolutely. And so in the last podcast, we talked about the impact 
that culture has on the aging process. And you, oh, yes. you've looked at many, uh, you talked to many people in, in different cultures that are over a hundred years old and, and living healthfully and vibrantly. And, and you got, you took, you had some really interesting takeaways from those people, right? Yes. I studied the uh, centenary, healthy centenarians all over the world, uh, all the five zones and beyond. Uh, and, what I found is that at first I thought as a neuropsychologist, well, it's going to be genes. And they even have the Methuselah gene. Well, that's nonsense. 20% is only the genes consistently. What I found is that, and I had to develop a theory around these people because they know what they're doing and I had to learn from them. And what I found is that we culturally create these, what I call portals of aging. And each culture has a different way of looking at the portal. So for example, a portal is a newborn and you have the infant, the child, the adolescent, the young adult, and then especially the middle age, which is really very significant. And then of course you have the elderly. All those things are mostly cultural rather than biological. So for example, if you are in a culture that says that 45 is middle age, you're in the fishbowl of that portal and middle age, not only do you, are you programmed or, or designed to, to believe that because of what you were taught, but if you try to get out, they'll admonish you back into that portal. What do you mean? At, four, at 45, you're, you're middle-aged. You, you shouldn't be thinking about going back and getting a PhD. You have to go to your retirement. Why are you wearing that skirt? Do you want to look like a teenager? And they bring you back into that. And then you begin to age and you begin to get sick with the middle age because your biology would acquiesce to the portals. And then in the aging, what I found is that the... Uh, um, centenarians don't have, they live agelessly. They live space conscious rather than time conscious. So they live in that future present that, that I was talking to you before the interview, which I'll talk about later. Uh, one of them, uh, I always remember because he had a, a vegetable garden and he was 102. And I said, that's a really nice vegetable garden. Uh, it, uh, what are you, what, what you going to be doing with it? And I said, well, this is nothing compared to four years from now. Wait till you see it in four years. The guy's 102. So, so they live in the present, but with a future component, not afraid of dying. Uh, they see themselves as ageless. I saw another one in Cuba, a 102-year-old man. He said, look at that old guy, how he's walking. And the old guy was probably 30 years younger than him. So they don't have a sense of, of age, and they, they don't have the aging. So the way I define it is growing older means passing of time, inevitable. Aging is what you do with that time based on what you assimilated from your culture. And that's what you see with people who retire. Their brain is set to be curious and they go to Florida to watch the sunset. They get sick within the first year and they die within four or five years. Uh, because it, we're not built for that. We're built to, to be developmentally uh, learning until the moment we die. So it's totally different. Yeah, so we want to keep active, keep thinking about the future um, and planning. And I mean, of course, I think it's important to live in the moment too, but yes. if you're, if you're um, you know, if you're setting yourself up in that environment too, where you've got other people that are living active lifestyle and they're continuing to learn and, and grow and develop, then that helps support your own uh, growth and development, right? Yes, very much because we're, as you said, we're social beings. We have to have someone that confirms, uh, not necessarily our beliefs, but, but our consciousness and people that you can talk about. And you can say, again, the example of going back to school at 45, what a great idea. What are you going to major in? That's totally different than admonishing you back into some age that has been determined. For example, if you want to retire in, uh, um, in, in, Turk, in let's say, Australia, uh, you have to wait till 70. You want to retire in Turkey, you can retire at 45. So what does that mean? It's just culturally determined. But you, in, in some countries in, South America, in, uh, in Europe, they'll give you a cane social service when you turn 50 because eventually you're gonna need it. And you see people with canes after 50. It's, 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 it's totally cultural, not biological. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so when we talk about disease too, uh, illnesses, disease, what, what is around us and our surrounding, surroundings and what people say around us and what we believe ourselves has a very big impact on the physical body and the disease process, right? I mean, there are a lot of different layers, of course, to disease, but I know that you've been looking at a lot about some of, some of the diseases. And I, I know before we started the recording, we talked about skin diseases and how that can be impacted by our belief system. Yes, and, and now we have the, the, the new 
uh, religion is the high priest with the white coats, you know, especially allopathic medicine. And the, the holy host that they give you is a pill, and, and the, the wine that you drink is uh, whatever medication you're taking. So there's a tremendous amount of placebo and placebo effect on, on the people that you give up your power to and start to co-author your health with. So what, and when they give you these sentences, well, this is how it is. You're going to have to live with it for, for the rest of your life, or that's how that is, and what do you want for your age? Those kind of admonitions that disempower you and take your personal agency away. You say, well, I guess the doctor knows, so that's it. I'm going to live with this. So when you begin to challenge that into, into intelligently with the help of professionals or like yourself and other people, okay, then you can begin to challenge that. And you can say, all right, if the body is responding to my consciousness, and as you know, truly uh, genetic illnesses are like three, three, four percent, no more. The rest is learned in some way, uh, the acquired illnesses. So you have uh, an over, let's say, a hyper uh, immunological response in this case would be like um, skin uh, disorders, psoriasis or whatever. So you begin to look at it and you begin to see, all right, my body's doing something that's incompatible with the way it was designed to be. And those are the causes of health. As homo sapiens, we have 150,000 years of trial and error for the causes of health, not, not to get sick, but what are the causes of health that we learned? And we can apply those. That, that information is in, but it's, it's the wisdom that if you eat a hamburger, it turns into Trevor. How does it do that? Well, it's tremendous intelligence that we have that, it, that it's implicit. So what we try to do is to then go to that intelligence and say, all right, uh, let's say you have psoriasis and you do all the other things that you're doing, the diet and whatever, the topical, whatever. Now let's look at it in a different way, in addition Let's say that your immune system is over-responding. And in your case, you have a genetic predisposition for skin disorders. Other people would be diabetes, whatever. Predisposition, not sentence. Let's find out how you're over-responding to the world in general. How are you over... Why is your immune system responding to... Uh, like if you have an allergy, uh, a, 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 a just microorganism as if it were an elephant. And other people don't. Well, you have a predisposition. So in psoriasis, for example... What you're, you're saying is, all right, let me look at this. What is my life like? Where am I over-responding? Where am I uh, hypervigilant about things? And how did I learn to get sick? Which is really a hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. How, did, how can you learn to get sick? You learn to get sick because eventually, at some point, what ha whatever happened to you had a function. So let's say you ha it had a function for you to overreact in the world. And maybe even have some allergies because it was necessary because you had abusive parents or because you were living in a war zone or whatever, that's adaptive and you don't get sick there because it's an override of, of conservation. That's necessary. Conservation will override any dysfunction. But if you keep living that and you're no longer in the war zone and you're no longer with your parents who are abusive, then it loses the function. It reaches a critical mass and we give it a name psoriasis or diabetes or whatever. We begin to treat the external process uh, rather than treating how this thing was learned. How did this person learn these behaviors? And why is it that uh, siblings, one will have it and another will won't? Because we have a very uh, subjective reality of how we interpret the world. I've worked with um, uh, patients who, identical twins were both um, sexually abused by the father. And with the three archetypal wounds that I've talked about, uh, uh, abandonment, betrayal, and, and shame, one of them will see the abuse as betrayal. The other one will see it as shame. Identical genetics. And they each have a different psychoneurological process with shame and, uh, and abandonment. So those are examples. And what you want to do is become a detective of your, of your body. And your body's a lab. And you can get excited about what you're going to be finding. Rather than, oh, my God, I have this. I, this is a genetic thing. Or this is a, uh, I have to live this for the rest of my life. And I've worked with so many different illnesses and seen so many good things happening, as I'm sure you have that there's something to this awareness of am I over-responding, under-responding, or am I doing an auto uh, self-destruction kind of thing? And in many cases, uh, because inflammation, in many cases, people with these kinds of problems, especially autoimmune, have a shame um, type of archetypal wound. I've seen, I have not seen an fibromyalgic who didn't have some kind of shame uh, or, or uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And most illnesses, including depressions, more uh, inflammatory kinds of things than serotonin. So if you can identify the inflammatory components, 
then you can begin to see, okay, here it worked. And, and the other thing is that the patient can learn, look how, how intelligent you are. Your body knew how to uh, adjust to something very difficult that was necessary and it, was, it wasn't making you sick. But now your body says, can we come up with something new? And you're not giving it to something new. So that's some of the ideas. I, I think it's really important how we talk to ourselves, how we treat ourselves. And that yes. self-talk is so powerful. And I think that it's automatic for most of us, really probably all of us, it's like that we become habitual. We can become, get into these patterns and it may start from our parents or siblings or others that are around us a lot when we're children and that we, we, we kind of modeling from other people and, and how we see them treat themselves. And then we end up doing it ourselves, and it can be extremely powerful in both a negative way or a positive way. And I, I think that because it's hard to see how our words are actually hurting our bodies in that moment for us to see with our own eyes, it's hard for people to really understand that. But I really do feel it's important to talk about. Yes, and, and, and there are two areas, two, two times that we're very vulnerable to these scripts that you're talking about. Before we go to sleep and, and just when we wake up. So one of the techniques that I teach, uh, and, and all of the, this, these interventions that I teach are, are under a contemplative state, something more than just uh, it's not hypnosis, not relaxation, just a, a reflective way of looking at things when the brain can turn off the, that, that prefrontal lobe of interpretation. So why? Because before you go to sleep, if you don't do these techniques, you're dumping the day into the dreams, uh, into your sleep. Then you wake up and you don't do it in the morning and you're dumping the dreams into the day. So it's a vicious cycle of scripts. You wake up in the morning. Oh God, this, I wonder how the psoriasis is going to be. Well, I'm going to, and you have a whole script about it. And what it does is not, not only does it perpetuate, but that level of stress will cause some immunological suppression with uh, norepinephrine and so forth. And then your immune system is not, it's not doing its work. It's confusing itself some more. So at least you, you get out of the scripts, and then anytime you catch yourself with a script, I wonder how my Sarah, stop, uh, take a deep breath and say, okay, what, what am I doing now to myself to hurt myself? And, and the script is that you're identifying yourself with that. Now, I, I don't mean just affirmations that I'm okay. It has to be embodied. It has to be embodied. So the technique that I, that I mentioned to you, where you go into the future in your mind, and, and I'll explain a little bit further. Uh, then not, not only do you see yourself there, but you bring yourself into the present and you begin to live as if in the present. And, uh, and Christiane Northrup and I have done this with uh, anti-aging with these uh, ideas of uh, looking at a picture of yourself 10 years uh, earlier and then living it uh, throughout the day. Well, this works even better because if you look at a picture when you were 10 years uh, earlier and you felt uh, more energetic and everything, it still has some contamination with old scripts. It could be that you look really good, but it just happens that you were in a bad relationship and all of those scripts start coming out with the NIM. So in the pristine future, you create whatever you want and then you live it. It's not just an affirmation, but it's an embodied affirmation, living it as if. And then you see the psoriasis. And this may sound very uh, naive, but there's got good neuropsychology behind it. You see the psoriasis, and you say, oh, yeah, this is, this is my, uh, my mind-body uh, memory. Good. Okay. What is, my, what is my present now? My present is without it. I'll act as if uh, it's not happening. And you would think that's very naive. No, you're creating neural maps that are actually creating a reality that's incompatible with the neural maps that maintain the, uh, the psoriasis or whatever that you're trying to do. And as you know, neural maps that are not used begin to lose their power. And it's not as simple as that, but there's a, a neuropsychological component to it as well as a psychoneurological component. But the thing about it is that you have to look at the culture. If the culture says, your father had psoriasis, your uncle has psoriasis, that's it, you have psoriasis. You give up your agency. Well, that's it. Instead of questioning it, that's what centenarians will do. I, I talked to a centenarian, he said that he went to a doctor and the doctor told him, uh, you need to take this and this and this. And he questions, why? Uh, you need to take this for this, this for that. He said, okay, I'll take this. I won't take the other two. You have to. Don't worry. I'm not going to sue you. It's okay. So then I asked him later, so how are you doing? I'm doing great. What does the doctor think now? He said, I don't know. He died about two years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's that kind of thing that you get 
from these people that are outliers, but they're not naive. They know their bodies. And the doctors may know more physiology, but you know more your phenomenology than any doctor or any other person. So you co-author with them, but you don't let them dictate your reality uh, because every, everyone's different. Well, and I think it's, you know, I've got some people that are practitioners that, that watch, listen to the podcast too. And I think it's, it's great for practitioners, for doctors to have this mindfulness when they're talking to yes. their patients or clients. So just want to slide that in there um, in hopes Very that that will help. And I, you know, I really want to emphasize what you talked about, about affirmations, because I think it's easy for people to put words down. You know, I'm you know, I'm, I'm beautiful. I'm whatever, you know, like my skin is great. But if you don't really like what you're saying about if it, about embody, you've got to really believe it and bring it in because there's this disconnect. If you just see the words and you still think in your mind, that's great. I know I'm supposed to do this, but I don't really believe it. Then it's not going to work. Right. Exactly. And, and I'll just mention it, just a really brief neuropsychology behind it or neuroscience behind it. Uh, so, so that your audience can see that it's not something that just made up in a dream or, you know, some kind of um, hallucination. Uh, if you have an affirmation and it's just words, it's going to be on the left side of the hemisphere. It's going to be on, on the language side, the Broca and the Wernicke area of the brain. It's going to be there. All right. So you have a neural map of the language. Fine. But the way that behavior is um, created and, and brought into an existence is by movement. So for example, with cats, if they don't allow them to move and they can see the world, once you let them move and they have not had the movement, they walk around as if they were blind for six weeks. So movement brings the closure to the behavior. So let's say you have the affirmation and then you embody it and you say, this is what I feel now and I'm gonna live as if the affirmation. What happens, you create neuromaps maps of movement, neuromaps maps of affect, the psychoterminology that's going on with the neuro, neuro, neuro maps. After a while, the affirmation becomes a part of you rather than just a, a wishful thought that doesn't go anywhere other than the left hemisphere of language. Yeah. So you, do you have some, just so people can really understand this fully, do you have some examples that you can share? It doesn't have to be skin issues. I know we've been talking about psoriasis, but I, um, certainly as far as skin issues go, it really is that there are a number of skin issues, eczema, acne, rosacea, a lot of different, especially chronic skin issues, even skin recovering from, uh, you know, traumas and things, I think. But do you have specific e examples in, uh, that you could share with us? It doesn't have to be a skin issue, anything health-related that could show an example of this. Uh, yeah, well, I'll use, I'll use skin. Uh, uh, and let's say psoriasis in a particular, uh, let's say uh, left arm. One of the things that, uh, that I try to uh, use is a lot of the research has already been done and put it into biocognitive theory. A lot of research has been done in psychology with what, what's called the semantic differential, Oswood's semantic. And what he said is that we can only look at the world with three main variables. You could either, it has power, strong, weak. It has speed, fast, slow. But it has uh, the valuation, which is good, bad, pretty, and so forth. So what I've done with, uh, let's say psoriasis, left side, you go into that contemplative state. And the reason for that is to turn off that uh, the prefrontal lobe that's constantly uh, uh, judging and beta waves and all that and doesn't let you really go in. So once you, do, you go in and you go into a, a more uh, subdued, uh, uh, accepting way of uh, looking at the world, then you go to that left side, let's say it's the left elbow, and you give it a semantic space. The semantic space would be it's red, it's hot, it's ugly. Uh, it's fast or slow, whatever. You give it a semantic space and you give it a form. Uh, it's, it's round or it's amorphous or whatever. Then there's always a part of the body that doesn't have the problem. You go to the part of the body that doesn't have the psoriasis. And so you go to your right elbow, that's fine. Then you give the semantic differential to that. All right, this part is beautiful. It's blue, green. Uh, it's slow. Uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's strong or it's weak, whatever you want to give it that is the opposite of that. Then you imagine one and the other, one and the other, you go back and forth, back and forth, and you allow the, the one that's working to overwhelm the other one. I've done this with chronic uh, pain 
neurosurgeons that have sent me patients who, who tell me I can't give them any more narcotics because they'll die. We have to do this. And some of them have even come, have taken off, have had their implants removed and things because what happens is that in the health side, we have a lot of evolved emotions and a lot of good psychoneurology. And the other side, we have a lot of fear-based emotions and a lot of primitive under-immunity kinds of things, over-immunity. So one side goes to the other, and not only are you taking the imagery, but you're taking the whole physiology to that side, and it begins to overwhelm it slowly, overwhelm it slowly. But you have to ask always, all right, so what is this doing for you? The, the, the secondary uh, gains, you have this arise. What is it that you don't have to do anymore that, 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 that you don't want to do? But uh, one more important, what is it that you can't do that you could if you didn't have this arise, but you don't feel worthy of doing? And it has those two components that need to be looked at. And a lot of times, uh, it's not so much a secondary gains, but well, if I didn't have the psoriasis, I could, I could fall in love or somebody would like me, but then I have a fear of being loved or being, or, or being abandoned or whatever. Well, the psoriasis keeps you in a good place. So it's got a lot, it, there's physiology, no question, but the physiology can be modified with the psychoneurological cultural components. Right. So there are some components of this that would help someone set someone up for success on this because it would be hard I think or harder it's not impossible to do this alone but it would be easier to do it with um, with some support so what kind of support do you think people need to really be able to go through this kind of process well partly to see you <laughs> they need a professional to guide them and then uh, look at the co-authors because as I know the co-authors are the people that 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 author your reality with you. Let's say you have a co-author who says, this is family, this is, this is it, you know, this is the Sarias family. And anytime you talk about it, that's nonsense. Look, that's just nothing. They know what they're talking about. You, you can't co-author with people like that because you won't get better. You have to co-author, number one, with people that have done well, that give you hope, because hope is immunologically very powerful. It's one of the causes of health. Uh, and then you have to look at the people that are encouraging you, not in a naive way, uh, not Pollyanna, everything's wonderful if you have good thoughts, but people are saying, you know, there's a lot to this, a lot of science to this, that let's work this out and let's see what, what we can do. Uh, I have this problem with this, you have this problem with that, let's, let's work the techniques together and see how they help each other. That kind of social support is really, really powerful in creating a new reality of hope. Uh, when, when hope is gone, it's been measured. When people give up NK cells and, and, and cells that are very... Um, uh, responsible for fighting precancer cells, not only do they become less efficient, but the population drops. So you have an immunological response and consequence for the way that you see things with hope or no hope, or, or this is a genetic sentence or it's not. Um, so what I'm saying is that there's a lot that we can do if we get our agency back and then work with professionals who are willing to support what you're trying to do based on good science. Right. And I know family is not always easy. Um, we, we don't always get to choose. Um, oh, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what do, you, what do you do about family? Um, I mean, I, you can choose your friends and you can, you can pick them and you can surround yourself with the practitioners, with doctors. Uh, yeah, any, any tips on what to do with family? <laughs> Well, yeah, not to, try to, not to try to change the people who are into their, their fear. Because if you do, they're better at fear than you are. So what you do is you don't, you don't discuss, you try to get away from, because I'm, I'm sure you've seen it with your patients, how are you doing today? I want to ask that. When I was working in a psychiatric hospital, we would never ask the chronic pain patients, how are you doing? We would ask them, what have you done today? If you ask them what you're doing, well, it, uh, uh, it, uh, how are you feeling? Like this hurts, that hurts, da, da. What have you done? Nothing. What would you like to do? My pain is really bad. What would you like to do? Always action oriented. That's the first thing. So when people will talk to you, let's say a mother says, well, darling, how's your psoriasis? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm, right now what I'm doing is I'm going out to the movies. And, uh, but how is your psoriasis? Uh, I haven't thought about it, so I don't know. See, that, that, that you have to neutralize because if you get into the dialogue, you, they have a lot of power over you. People that change your diapers have a lot of power over you. So you have to be aware of who they are and not pay attention because they're going to do a nocebo on you no matter what other people tell you. Gradually, what will happen is you begin to shape them into thinking of Trevor rather than what Trevor is identifying herself with in a particular illness. 
gradually. And then you don't talk about your illness to anybody. And that might seem counterintuitive, but if somebody says, uh, do you want to go to the movies? Oh no, my psoriasis is acting up. No, uh, I don't want to go to the movies because I, I'm going to stay at home and relax or whatever. And what cultures do is they force you to over-inform. Oh, come on, you could relax another time. But if you say the psoriasis, they'll leave you alone. So the cultures are set up to maintain illnesses rather than get you out of illnesses. In fact, they become very compassionate with you when you tell them you have a problem. But if you say, you want, I want to take care of me, no. You go to a restaurant by yourself and they'll say only one. And you look around and say, well, how many do you need? So it's set up that way to, to take the, uh, the self out of the equation and it, it only has value when other people's collective needs are met at your expense. So all of that is culture. This is why culture is so important in looking at an illness. Yeah, I really do think it's, uh, it's important to take identifying with an illness uh, that to separate that. I, it, I don't know how many times I've heard patients say, my, my eczema, my acne, my, you know, and they're like, they're identifying that like that's theirs and they're owning, they're owning it. it. Yeah, yeah, they're owning it. So what, and what that's, yeah. So you, can we just talk about the acne or the acne you used to have or <laughs> something along those uh, lines? Uh, or do you? Yes, I, like my, my skin reaction is very interesting. I'm working on it. You see, you shift uh, uh, the skin reaction is very interesting. I'm working on it, and I'm uh, I'm becoming a really good detective to see what's going on. The the patient with the or the, the patient the, the person with the the uh, glucose issues, he finds the um, he, he finds the context extremely important. And Ellen Langer at Harvard has done a lot of work with that, with everything from cancer to diabetes. The context is, re it's not an illness, it's not just a, uh, a static process, but the context has variability. So then what, what you do is you find under what conditions is this uh, uh, um, exacerbated? Under what conditions does it seem to be regressing? But the other problem is that I talk about in that article I sent you, uh, what I call the um, change allowance. Change allowance says this should take this long, not just an illness, falling in love, intimacy, uh, wellness, aging, they all have a change allowance. And if, if it goes too fast, you tend to not believe and you tend to sabotage it. You can't, well, what happens then when you have uh, spontaneous remissions? Biology can't explain that, immediately gone. And, and, the, and some doctors will say it's either misdiagnosed or um, you're just having a hysterical reaction that will bring the illness back. They can't buy that there's some, there's a, there's a uh, and it's cultural too, there's this, Change allowance is cultural to a certain degree. So for example, well, people will say, well, look, if you have an infection, it's an infection. You're gonna have an antibiotic and that's it. No, it's not, that's not it. You have an infection in the United States and you know that there are uh, pathogens and you find the right antibiotic and you take it and it gets better. You go to the Amazon and you have an infection and a shaman happens to tell you, you see that wound, an evil spirit has gotten into that wound. Unless he does some kind of exorcism, a tremendous amount of antibiotics is going to do almost nothing. That's an immunological biosymbol. Now, if the shaman comes with a doctor and says, look, the doctor and I are going to work with this. I'm going to exercise the uh, demon or whatever. And then the doctor is going to give you the, this kind of medication. And both of them are powerful medication. It'll be fine. And I've seen it. I've seen it in Bolivia and other places. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And so with this kind of experience, what, how, how much time does this take? Is this, I mean, I, I think sometimes people in today's society expect really quick fixes. So I want yes. to talk You're right. about timelines of, and expectations. Well, the, the, uh, the importance of that is that when you're doing, uh, let's say you're doing this method, you want to, uh, at the beginning, you want to prolong that, that, that uh, change allowance. Because if you're looking for a quick fix, it doesn't work. It's an organic, gradual process. So you want to prolong the, the process. And then rather than looking at the outcome, I want this to be this way, let me look at the things I'm learning about myself and the process. And what can I change that not only expresses a psoriasis, but expresses an overreaction with my partner or an overreaction when something happens. And I have taught my system to overreact and join the expression of genes that has to do with psoriasis or, or whatever illness. So 
so when you're curious, you take away the fear. Fear and curiosity are incompatible. So you, you go into curiosity mode rather than fear mode, and then you allow yourself to have hope. And the hope has to do with having unconditional caring for yourself, even in times where you don't think you can care. Automatically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna believe I'm, I'm worthy, even though I may not believe it now. I'm gonna allow myself to believe it. Why? Because if you're not worthy, you're not gonna work on anything to do something good for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then lastly, I know I wanted to, you mentioned this thing about what is normal and kind of mediocrity and how a lot of people, we, a lot of people settle for that, but the, there's another way, right? Yes. Normal to me is very troublesome. I don't want to be normal. <laughs> uh, because normal, is, is, is a, it puts you in some, some kind of mediocrity of what is acceptable. So, for example, some doctors will say, look, I got to tell this person they have six months to live. So why? Because it's my ethical uh, responsibility and I could be sued. Why don't you do it this way? Uh, you tell this person, you have this illness that on the average, on the, on the normal curve, people live uh, six months. You go to the other side of the curve, they, they, they live five weeks. But then you go to the outlier on the right side of the curve and they've been around for 10 years. So why don't we explore what these people are doing so we don't uh, fulfill the prophecy of the normal or the norm? If you have an illness that's within the norm, you're in good shape because you'll get medication. If you're on the other side, uh, I don't know. There's nothing I can do for you. It's, it's gone. So I think the, the normal thing has become a bit of a, of a restraining process for people because sometimes outliers by definition are not normal. So they don't fit and they think there's something wrong with them. Every outlier that I've talked to when they were kids, they thought they were weird. I had these ideas. This, this one told me the other day that uh, when I was nine years old, I was wondering about my existence. I was wondering, how do I do with uh, <laughs> the universe and, and the infinite? And another kid saying, what toy am I going to play with? There's a depth and curiosity, and that's what makes them outlier because they see beyond what everybody's seeing. And centenarians are that way. Centenarians have a high level of curiosity. They'll, if I'm a centenarian, I'm talking to you, and I say, uh, hey, Trevor, what's that book behind there? And they, they have immediately, they go into curiosity rather than speaking to you as if that's it, and, uh, and there's no novelty at all. Novelty is another cost of health. Novelty is a cost of health. You want to get better? You need to find novelty in your world and within you. Yeah. Okay. I love all that. All right. Well, Mario, it's been great having you back on. Yeah, Tell sure. everybody where they can find you. Uh, it's just uh, Google Biocognitive Science, uh, and then um, they can, uh, or, or my Facebook page, uh, Dr. Mario Martinez, uh, biocognitive.com. Anything that has to do with biocognitive science, my name will come up. Uh, and, uh, and then we can, we can go from there. I have a, a private group that I've set up at Facebook to create this uh, subculture of wellness that people can join. And, and there, the, what they do is they, they, they reinforce their excellence. Uh, and it's really a powerful, uh, powerful way to look at it. Uh, and, and all that information is up on, on you know, the, the website and everything. But thank you for all the work you do, because you do outstanding work. And, uh, and I'm really glad that we had a chance to talk again. Yeah, thank you, Mario. And um, I'll get those links for me. I'll put them up um, below your sh the show notes. On, on yes, the we'll put it up and, and get all that out to, to people that, uh, uh, that are going to understand it and, and, and benefit from it. All right. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Mario Martinez and found out some ways, some tools to help you reprogram the way that you talk to yourself, to look at the environment, to look at the culture that you're in and set that up in a healthier way to help your skin and your health. To learn more about Dr. Mario, you can go to thespotdoctor.com, go to the podcast page with his interview, and you'll find all the information and links there. And while you're there, I invite you to join the Spot Doctor community so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. And if you haven't already taken the skin quiz, you can go there at theskinquiz.com. Get your own customized skin report to find out what messages your skin is trying to tell you about your health and what you could do about it. Just go to theskinquiz.com. Also, I invite you to join me on social media. The Spa Doctor is everywhere on Facebook, 
Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So join us there, join the conversation, and I'll see you next time on the Spot Doctor Podcast. Thank you.